here in person. Uh, I, I always like to come back to Chicago. I, I lived in Downers Grove until I was 14. My father worked on Michigan Avenue near the Cathedral when HPAC Engineering had its, uh, its offices there. So this is where most of my family came from. And, uh, we picked a beautiful time to have this meeting. It's a lovely day. Um, my topic today is, is uh, something that everyone thinks they know something about, and a lot of it turns out to, to be not quite as certain as we thought. Some of it's just plain wrong. So we'll try to, to make carbon dioxide interesting to everyone for, uh, for 45 minutes here, and maybe you'll learn a couple of things along the way. Um, anyone who's worked in mechanical engineering and ventilation has, has been dealing with um, CO2 for the, the, the entirety of their career, and, and I, I think I'm actually kind of frustrated about some of the things that have been said about it during the pandemic, which is one reason I've gotten more uh, into it in, in, in recent times. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, uh, outdoor CO2. CO2 is, is something that occurs naturally. It's uh, uh, part of of nature, uh, but actually a very small part. I don't know if, if uh, anyone really thinks about what it means to have something in the atmosphere and in the uh, concentrations like a few hundred parts per million, but we'll start with the, the composition of dry air, about 78% nitrogen, and about 21% uh, oxygen, and the, the next most uh, numerous component of air isn't carbon dioxide, it's argon, the, uh, the noble gas. Uh, carbon dioxide is, is way down there as a trace <coughs> component at about 0.04% and rising. The first time that the, the measured CO2 concentration outdoors crossed 300 parts per million was in 1912, so over a century ago. Uh, in the 1960s, it was increasing at about one part per million per year, and that's up to about two and a half parts per million per year, which is what's uh, giving everyone Pause. The, uh, the figure over there on the uh, right-hand side comes from the place where we measure carbon dioxide uh, for the purpose of saying what it is globally on average. It's an observatory on uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and, and NOAA has a lot of information on atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's a website that you can see. So one thing that's obvious in this figure is the uh, increasing uh, rate of, of growth of carbon dioxide concentration from about 320 parts per million back when I was born in the late 50s to about 420 today. Also notice though that there's some uh, annual variation superimposed on it. The red line is the uh, actual value and the, the dark line is the uh, black line is the, the mean. So there's some fluctuation of that number and if you go to different places you'll measure different values. There are seasonal and regional and even local variations. Uh, some studies of, of CO2 concentration over land have found that typically there's about a 15 part per million uh, amplitude in a given year. Uh, that's generally due to things like vegetation cycles in parts of the world where there is a lot of vegetation that <coughs> comes and goes. But in urban areas, because uh, mainly of, of industry and, and uh, transportation, we can see much higher numbers and we can get CO2 domes over urban areas where the CO2 concentration in the U.S. has been measured to be over 600 parts per million. So we can't simply assume that it's 420 outdoors when we start using this for engineering purposes. Of course, we could talk for a long time about the intricacies of the carbon cycle, but it is a very interesting thing. and. and uh, uh, humankind seems to have been able to uh, influence this with the additional uh, CO2 that we're putting in from combustion, but there are a lot of exchanges going on all the time, uh, even without us, between large bodies of water and vegetation and uh, other uh, uh, fauna and flora that are on Earth. So that's what's outdoors. It's our point of reference. Now what about uh, human CO2 emissions? Um, so, um, life uh, for us on the simplest level involves uh, consuming sources of energy and, and uh, burning them so that we can do various things. Um, so CO2 production is a byproduct of metabolism. You take in carbohydrates and proteins and other things and uh, your cells convert them into 
energy and into structures in your body, and carbon dioxide is one of the uh, waste products that's produced as a result of that. Uh, the rate at which we're producing carbon dioxide depends on a lot of different things. Uh, fundamentally, most importantly, it's, it's the uh, metabolic rate. So what activity are we uh, doing at any given time? The, uh, the unit that we use to measure metabolic activity is, is called the, the MET, which many probably don't know is, is actually the amount of, of uh, uh, heat loss or heat, heat generation per unit of skin surface area. Uh, how do we find out what the skin surface area is? Uh, well, someone figured out a formula for doing that a long time ago, uh, someone named Dubois. So we have the Dubois skin surface area, which is a function of, of height and mass as shown there uh, below. And so to get your actual metabolic heat generation, you take the activity you're doing and the METs for that, and then you have to figure out what the uh, individual's uh, skin surface area is in order to be able to, to get the correct total. Uh, there's also an effect of age and gender on, on uh, CO2 production. Uh, some of this may simply be a function of differences in, in mass uh, between men and women, but uh, not entirely. And, and even diet is uh, a factor. So the amount of carbon dioxide it takes to uh, metabolize different kinds of food depends on uh, what they're made of. So there are a lot of really interesting um, things that make this complicated. The table on the right is a, a list of net rates for different activities. Uh, 1.0 is supposed to be a, a very sedentary person, or really someone who's just sitting still and, uh, and doing nothing. Office work we generally consider to be up about 1.2 met, and it can go up from there. Uh, I used to be a, a cross-country runner uh, a long time ago, uh, and you could do 10 met easily if you were, were uh, working out very hard in that kind of an activity, or if you were a, uh, say a Tour de France cyclist. So the range is really an order of magnitude between the lowest and highest. Uh, you might be interested in the concentration in exhaled breath. It's close to 40,000 parts per million. So if you want to screw up a, a CO2 sensor, uh, just breathe on it, and uh, you may have to go back and recalibrate it again. So this uh, figure comes from a really interesting recent paper by uh, Andy Persily at NIST and uh, uh, Dijon, a colleague of, of his. And uh, Andy is one of the, uh, the experts on the uh, significance of, uh, of CO2, and he's also um, an expert on how CO2 generation by people has been changing over time. The um, rate of emission actually depends, again, on how big we are, not just the, the activity. And this figure shows for people of different ages, and this is the male chart, there's one for, for women in the, uh, the paper too, um, the range of, of CO2 generation in, in liters per second at uh, uh, zero, uh, excuse me, zero degrees C and, and one atmosphere. And you can see that uh, as age increases for a while, at least to middle age, the, the peak goes way up and then it drops off. But there's a big spread between the lowest and the highest within any of these ranges. So if we're going to use CO2 for a, as a marker of anything in a building, we have to know who's there gender, age, uh, even size, and what are they doing? Otherwise, we, we have a hard time tying these emission rates back to the kinds of things we want to do, like calculate ventilation rates. So um, here are some data on uh, what the average rate is likely to be in different uh, environments based on the, the mix of of uh, age and gender and activity level. You see a lot of these are, are uh, around uh, 0 0.04, 0 0.05, but there's, there's some variation here. And, and for those who are more familiar with uh, uh, imperial units, if you will, than SI units, a liter per second is, is about 2 CFM. So that should help orient you. All the details on the assumptions that went into all of those numbers are in the notes below the table, but this suffice it to say that there's, there's a pretty big difference between 0 0.003 uh, 
and 0 0.055. So we, we need to have good estimates. And there's some concern that we've been using numbers based on uh, typical mixes of people of uh, the size that they were back in the 1960s. And so there's some discussion going on about revising that. So some key points about this, uh, if we're gonna use carbon dioxide to control ventilation, um, we need to have reasonably accurate emission rates. We're not going to be able to pinpoint them precisely, but we have to be close. Um, the, the values that we're using now are old, and uh, there are some who think that they need to be updated. Um, the metabolic rates are different. The, the gender mix in the workplace is different for offices. And race may even be a significant factor. Uh, studies were done of CO2 production of Chinese test subjects and were found to be significantly lower than the, the rates for Western subjects. So there's a lot of complexity here just right out of the box. So how do we use carbon dioxide to measure uh, outdoor airflow? When we do that, we're typically treating it as tracer gas. Tracer gas is something that we uh, put into an environment. In, in the ideal case, it isn't there at all or in very low concentrations. And then we can track the change in concentration of that uh, substance to determine something like uh, an air exchange rate. And there's a fairly significant baseline for uh, carbon dioxide, which is the outdoor concentration of 400 or so parts per million. Uh, but we get a significant increase indoors, you know, high enough that we can do reasonably accurate measurements. Uh, so the, the way that we normally think about this is shown in the first equation here, and there's, there's probably more math in here than I should have included in this talk, but I'll try not to uh, uh, get too mathematical about it. Essentially, the concentration we're going to find indoors at steady state, when everything is coming equilibrium, is going to be equal to what's outdoors, plus an additional amount that's proportional to the rate at which CO2 is being introduced into the air by us and the rate at which we're removing it with outdoor air. That's this term all the way over on the right. The top number of persons times the rate of CO2 generation, that's the source, and Q outdoor, and that's what's diluting it. Um, and for typical ventilation rates uh, that we've had in our standards for a long time, that increase would be about 700 parts per million. That corresponds to about uh, 15 or 16 CFM per person. Uh, we can rearrange that equation to calculate what the outdoor uh, airflow rate is, just doing a little bit of, of algebra. The, the problem with this equation is that we almost never have steady state in a space unless people are in it for a long time doing the same thing. So in most environments that we're in, we actually are somewhere between uh, what the minimum CO2 would be when nobody's there and the maximum when everybody's been there for a long time. And we're trying to imply things by measuring that number. Uh, the equation at the bottom is the uh, transient equation, which can tell us if we have a constant ventilation rate and a certain number of CO2 sources, how is it going to change over time? And here in this equation, we see that the, uh, the size of a room, as well as the flow rate of, of air, uh, B, the volume of the space, and Q, the, the volume of, of uh, outdoor air, affects how rapidly change occurs. That's the air change rate. And this is the only place that air changes really are important. They're a lousy measure of ventilation rate because um, you could have the same number of people in a space generating CO2 and the same flow of outdoor air if, if our room was suddenly twice as big, the air change rate would be half of what it was before, but the steady state concentration would be the same because we have the same number of people producing CO2, same amount of dilution. So it's caused a lot of confusion that air changes have come to be the way we talk about ventilation during the uh, pandemic. What this change in CO2 uh, tells us ultimately is what is the ventilation rate per person? So here's uh, an illustration of those two concepts. Graphically on the left, we have the uh, uh, concentration uh, normalized scale to some reference value as a function of the outdoor air flow rate, again, scale to some reference value. So we have a concentration of one with a, a ventilation rate of, of one. And if the ventilation rate increases, then 
the concentration decreases, and if we go the other way, it increases. So that's how we determine what the steady state concentration is. On the right is a figure that shows what happens if we have transient process with different air change rates, one, two, and five, and we get to the same place simply at different rates. But we don't know what that value is going to be unless we know what the actual flow rate is. So, CO2 is a, is a measure of outdoor airflow relative to our current ventilation standards. Um, here are some values of CO2 concentration that we would have at steady state for some uh, space types found in ASHRAE standard 62.1, the basis of our uh, building codes, uh, office, conference room, classroom, etc. And what we see over there on the, uh, uh, the far right is that we can be meeting the standard and have concentrations everywhere from just a little bit over 400 parts per million to almost 2,000 parts per million. And I'm, I'm sure everyone has heard uh, suggestions of what the indoor concentration should be for a space. And um, if we're going to go that direction, we would have to throw out uh, the approach we've been using to ventilation for uh, a long time. And there's nothing wrong, really, with 2,000 parts per million in a space like an auditorium based on all of the science that we have uh, behind that. So some of the complicating factors of, of doing this, of measuring uh, ventilation with carbon dioxide is, one, the variability of human emissions we talked about. Two, the outdoor concentration varies, so we have to measure it too if we're going to do this reasonably accurately. Uh, transient effects, which we just went through, and even spatial variability of, of concentration. I think if we walked around this room with a CO2 meter, we would probably find uh, several hundred uh, ppm of difference, depending on where in the room you were, because it takes a while for everything to get thoroughly mixed. So from my point of view, and this is what, I, what I've been arguing about for, for years before the pandemic, was that we should really use direct occupant counts. And I remember I, was, I really enjoyed the talk at the earlier rodeo where we had someone who was telling us about uh, uh, other ways of, of doing direct occupancy counts. That's far and away the better way to, uh, to do it. So there's no single CO2 concentration that's associated with good indoor air quality as we uh, describe it today. It can be a useful indicator of ventilation rate per person. Uh, because human bioaffluent tracks with carbon dioxide and that contributes to odors, which are one of the things we're trying to control with ventilation. But there are lots of other uh, contaminants that don't follow CO2 concentration, so emissions from uh, building materials, carpet, uh, uh, furniture, all the other things here, particles, ozone, radon, there are many contaminants um, that may be present in harmful quantities, and the CO2 concentration doesn't tell us uh, much about it. And these are um, uh, sensitive to controls other than ventilation. What I mean is that if we're removing particles with filters, the CO2 concentration doesn't tell us anything about how efficient our filters are, and that would go for any other type of control. And I, I note here another one of Andy Persley's nice articles, don't blame standard 62.1 for 1,000 parts per million CO2, widely held belief that ASHRAE said that that's what indoor CO2 should be in. Uh, never really happened. Talk about that on the break if you're interested in more detail. So this is one of the first um, and, and foremost uses of CO2 is to uh, control ventilation rates. What about CO2 as an air contaminant? This is something that has uh, had a lot of tension in uh, recent years. It wasn't that uh, it hadn't been looked at before, but we've changed uh, uh, the way we think about it. Uh, from an occupational health and safety point of view, we've had requirements for a long time. OSHA, uh, NIOSH, and others say it shouldn't exceed 5,000 parts per million in a workplace uh, because that may affect the ability of a worker to concentrate, start to have uh, toxic effects. If the immediately dangerous to life and health uh, level is 50,000 ppm, which is way, way over 
the levels we normally have indoors, which are typically uh, perhaps 1,500 parts per million or less. Now, there has been uh, research and discussion about the impact of relatively low carbon dioxide concentrations on um, cognitive function. They're controversial, and I'll uh, give you a, a little look at the, the controversy here um, soon. Um, to, to paraphrase the, uh, the paragraph here at the bottom, um, Ashcray recently published a position document on indoor carbon dioxide, and the conclusion was that the evidence on cognitive effects at such low levels is not to the point where it would justify changing any standards or regulations at this point. The uh, figure comes from a brand new indoor air quality uh, handbook and, and shows us some of the levels that we do believe we have some uh, confidence in. And, and note there are two columns here. One is carbon dioxide and one is, is uh, human bioeffluence with carbon dioxide. And what some of the research that's most credible has shown is that the CO2, as we've always tended to believe, is telling us more about how much bioeffluent there is than um, the level of actually being significant in itself. So, for example, for, for office work, no adverse effects uh, until 20,000 parts per million, uh, possibly some significance about 3,000 parts per million. But if we include bioaffluent variation with carbon dioxide variation, much lower level, about 1,600 ppm, where we can start to, to measure things, and so on. Um, there are many toxic effects that can occur from exposure to carbon dioxide. And Paracelsus told us everything is a poison. It's, it's only the dose that matters. <laughs> Even something that seems to be non-toxic can, can suffocate us if it isn't uh, oxygen. So here's a, a, a graphic I got from my friend Pavel Borgoski at uh, Technical University of Denmark. And it shows some of the different uh, things that can happen as a result of high concentrations. But notice the, the levels that are associated with these effects from, from 1 to 15 percent. 1 percent is 10,000 parts per million. So we're talking about toxic effects, truly toxic effects, only occurring at levels that are double the uh, occupational exposure limit. So they can happen, but it, it uh, would be uh, really unusual to have anything like that happen in most indoor environments. So the paper that, uh, for me at least, started this whole debate about um, cognitive effects was one by uh, Satish uh, et al., basically a group from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And uh, back in 2012, they, they published uh, a study where they had, had exposed uh, human subjects, students at Berkeley, I think, to uh, three different levels of carbon dioxide, and they'd vary the carbon dioxide by injecting pure CO2. So there was no variation of the bioeffluent levels. The outdoor air uh, flow was the same. So this was the only uh, thing that was happening. And they found uh, significant effects at 2,500 and uh, measurable effects at, at 1,000 parts per million um, in these studies. And these somewhat... Um, uh, agreed with an earlier study that had been done by some Hungarian researchers but using a different um, way of testing cognitive function. Uh, Satish in this study and in some others that had been done by uh, uh, Satish and Allen at uh, Harvard School of Public Health um, have used a uh, cognitive function tool that's proprietary and the results from uh, the earlier study are shown here on the, uh, the right hand side. So we can see that uh, uh, at 2,500 parts per million, the black symbols, there's significant lowering of performance relative to 600, which everyone would agree is indicative of good air quality. But uh, even at 1,000 parts per million in their study, they found uh, lower values of, of performance. Because if this holds up, then um, it could lead to significant changes in our ventilation standards if we're trying to provide the, uh, the kind of air quality that those standards purport to. Uh, specifically because of this study, uh, a group at Technical University of Denmark tried to replicate it, uh, but they went a little bit farther. So they replicated the experiments where they injected CO2 
into the spaces. And they also did the same experiment, but by varying the amount of outdoor air so that the bioeffluent concentration was changing at the same rate as a CO2 concentration. And they used about the same number of, of subjects. And what they found was that the pure injection of CO2 did not produce uh, significant effects, even at 3,000 parts per million. But when they allowed the bioeffluent to vary, it did. So this created a debate that's still ongoing about exactly what it is that um, is going on here. Is it the CO2, or is CO2 just indicating the, the bioeffluent concentration? So uh, the, the bottom line was that they saw a lot of these sorts of symptoms that are sometimes associated with CO2, but only when bioeffluent was very. All right, so um, we've talked about flow measurement and uh, toxic effects. Now, how about infection risk? Because this has come up in the last couple of years and been widely uh, discussed. There are a lot of factors that can affect our, our risk of uh, infection by a pathogen like SARS-CoV-2. Um, dose response, how many active virions does it take to get an infection? How many is a, an infector producing per unit of time? Um, how, how many infectors are there in the space? Let me finish the thought here. This is based on the uh, prevalence of the infection and um, the number of people who are present. So if we had uh, a real bad spot in, in COVID going on, 3% infection rate, we could figure out what the probability is that there's someone here who's infected. So that's one way of, of doing the risk assessment. Uh, what are the activity levels of susceptible individuals? The more you inhale, the, uh, the more likely you are to uh, be exposed to active virus. Uh, natural loss rates, how long does it take a virus outside the body to lose its activity? And what controls are we using? Uh, are we wearing masks? Uh, is there ventilation? Is there filtration that's effective for the particle sizes that we're concerned about? We're we using UV. All of these things affect risk. And then there's at the, the end of the day the definition of acceptable risk. So if we want to know um, what ventilation rate we need, uh, and what CO2 concentration corresponds to that, we have to have already decided what level of infection we think is, is okay. And this has been um, built into models like the Wells-Riley model of infection that's been used throughout the, the COVID pandemic. It has lots of uh, weaknesses that infectious disease people like to, to point to, but it also is a, an equation. It's pretty simple that we can get data for and, and use. Um, I've color-coded the key things here. Uh, how much infectious material is being produced is a function of how many infectors I and, and the rate at which they're producing infectious doses, which Wells and Riley called quanta. Uh, so proportional to how much air someone who's susceptible is inhaling, so their pulmonary ventilation rate, P, multiplied by the time they're uh, exposed to the contaminated air, in both of those increase and risk goes up. And then we have Q here, which uh, I'm calling uncontaminated air. It could be outdoor air, but it could be air that's been cleaned by a, a HEPA filter. So we can use um, a method like this to determine what the airflow rate is, and then using the methods we've discussed for calculating ventilation rate and relating to CO2, uh, we could do that. And that has been done. Um, but some have gone a little bit farther and tried to identify CO2 uh, directly as um, an infection risk indicator using a concept called the, uh, the rebreathe air fraction. So all the carbon dioxide that's in the air that's above the outdoor concentration is there because somebody exhaled it. And so every breath we take, we're inhaling a certain amount of air that somebody else exhaled, which I, I think we've been doing since the beginning of time. But when you think about it too hard, it can, can bother you. Um, so we can go through an analysis to uh, relate the carbon dioxide concentration increase above outdoors to the fraction of air that you're inhaling that was exhaled by someone else. And then if we keep adding to this analysis, well, how many infectors are there likely to be present? At what rate are they producing infectious doses? Then that can be uh, worked into a, uh, a measure of dose and of 
infection probability. So when you see um, discussions of, of rebreathed air fraction, and it, it should be X, and so the CO2 concentration should be Y, uh, this is where it, it comes from. This idea was actually first floated by uh, Donald Milton, and uh, Rudnick is a student at uh, uh, Maryland, and uh, that was for influenza, but uh, Pang and Jimenez have uh, retreaded it for COVID. It's exactly the same uh, idea. Now, in terms of uh, just prescriptively specifying a CO2 concentration, Riva, the uh, European organization uh, for HBAC, similar to ASHRAE, has um, looked at this and did some relative infection risk calculations using the Wells-Riley model and came up with some recommendations for uh, CO2 concentration in offices that are shown uh, in, in this figure. And even here, we don't have one single value that, uh, that they're recommending that's correct all the time. But, uh, somewhere between 600 and 800 ppm is where most of those sorts of recommendations are, are coming uh, out. So uh, caveats, there are lots of assumptions involved in estimating infection risk. Even if we left CO2 out of it completely, it's very complicated and not very accurate at present. Um, the models that we're using now, like Wells Raleigh, don't account for, for proximity. Um, there's a lot less risk to the folks in the front row of me standing here than if I, if I walk over and you know, breathe directly on them. We all know about that. There, there is truth to uh, uh, that. Uh, aspect of distancing. So there is that. And um, um, prevalence in the population, from my point of view, and trying to reduce the basic reproductive number to less than one, so a person in a space causes less than one infection, that may be comforting on an epidemiological level. But if you send your kids to school, you wonder when they're going to get infected. And that's a different calculation than the one that's done at the level of uh, population health. All right, so uh, now let's go on to something else that we all uh, have come to uh, love and believe in, which is demand-controlled ventilation using carbon dioxide. Um, and the idea here is that if we uh, control the CO2 concentration in the space, we can satisfy the uh, objectives of our ventilation standards um, even though our ventilation standards determine the ventilation rate based on the number of occupants and the, uh, the area. And to do these calculations correctly, you have to have an actual occupant uh, count, which is hard to estimate, um, especially when we have transient CO2 concentrations in space. They're generally below what they're going to peak out at um, at the beginning of occupancy. So. The, what I measure now is lower than the steady state concentration. There are for a higher uh, outdoor airflow rate per person. And later, everybody leaves the space, and I measure the same concentration. And it actually may be overventilated because uh, the concentration is declining. Uh, the consequence of having both area and occupant uh, components of, of ventilation is that uh, the theoretical set point we should be maintaining <laughs> changes with the number of occupants. And we have other factors like ventilation effectiveness that impact how well the outdoor air is distributed, uh, calibration and placement of sensors. Uh, all of these have, have always been problems that we, we tend to overlook. And if we have multiple space systems, things get really complicated because we're recirculating in those systems, a large fraction of air that has carbon dioxide in it that came from other spaces, and doing the uh, the math to do the ventilation controls accurately again uh, is is difficult, which doesn't stop many from from doing CO two based control under those circumstances anyway. Then the final thing that bothers me about CO two based uh, DCD is that it's mainly done to save energy. Uh, if we didn't want to save the energy that we could save by reducing the ventilation rate, it would be better to just have more outdoor air and, and set it at the, the full occupancy and we would have better ventilation all the time. 
The figures on the, the right come from a, a paper by uh, William Fisk uh, from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and he did a report on CO2 sensors. It was a while ago, and they've probably gotten better, but his conclusion was that uh, many of the sensors they tested weren't accurate enough to do what they were supposed to do in uh, ventilation control applications. So here's a, a single zone example of what I'm talking about with varying set points. So let's say that uh, uh, an average person in a space is producing 0.31 liters per minute of uh, CO2. It's an adult at uh, 1.2 met, and we have 420 parts per million outdoors. If we look up what the ventilation rate should be for that space, ASHRAE standard 62.1 tells us um, that we should have two and a half liters per second per person plus 0.6 liters per second per meter squared of area, and we'll do the calculation here for a thousand meter squared uh, library uh, with a hundred persons in it. And uh, the CO2 concentration that corresponds to different numbers of occupants that exactly meets the 62.1 requirement is shown here. So it, it uh, is a little over a thousand at full occupancy. If we go to, to 50, we're below 800. If we stayed at 1,000, as occupancy decreased, we'd actually be underventilating the, uh, the space. And this is something that happens just on the level of one space, and then we put a bunch of them together on a system and, and want to control all of that. So this is, is complicated, and it's why I hope that the uh, technology for direct counts will continue to improve and get more affordable at the same time. So now a couple of, uh, of other things that are uh, very current. One is, is personal CO2 monitors. I have my personal CO2 monitor with me that I carry around just for, for fun, <laughs> which says 1324 right now, by the way. But no, no reason to panic. <laughs> says the humidity is 56%, which is good. Um, so these have become widely used for uh, uh, determining whether kids are safe at school. Parents put them into the backpacks. We take them into restaurants to decide whether the, uh, even if the food isn't good, is the air safe. Um, people take them to their hotels. I got the CO2 over uh, 1,000 ppm in my hotel room last night, just one person uh, sitting around, and on, uh, on airplanes. So uh, people are seeing a lot of data. The question is, do they have any idea what it means, and is it really helping us? And it could, but sometimes it, it doesn't. So there, there are good uses, but there's a lot of misinterpretation possible. What the uh, CO2 monitor can mostly tell you is when a space is really badly ventilated. You see a really high number, somebody should look at the, uh, the ventilation or open a window. Uh, a low value may or may not tell you that things are good. So here is some of my own personal data, or hopefully I'm not giving away too much information here. This is from uh, my CO2 monitor sitting uh, at home over the, the weekend, and you can see things are, are pretty good there. We keep a lot of windows open, so a high was only about 900 ppm during this uh, period. And you can, can see here uh, you know, when people were in the bedroom, uh, you can actually see when I went to, to bed pretty late here, because it jumped up. And I think at some point, uh, I, I may have opened a window somewhere as it dropped and then climbed some more. So get up in the morning, it goes down, mess around in the bedroom, get dressed, and go to the office, and, and it, it drops. So uh, you can learn a lot about uh, how well ventilated your house is by looking at this over time. And we found that uh, we needed to open uh, windows to keep the, the air quality where we wanted it to be. Uh, but more interesting, here's my travel day yesterday, and this is what uh, you find people tweeting about all the time. Um, these times are shifted one hour because by the time I downloaded this, I was in central time zone, so I didn't actually get on a plane at 5 a.m. It was it's more like 6 a.m. So this is home, drive to the airport. Uh, this is boarding plane at State College, and actually, um, we never got back to steady state between there and, and Philadelphia. It peaked out over, over 2,000. Uh, this is deplaning. And then in the airport, it was pretty good. And then uh, flight to Chicago, right? So again, boarding, not much air conditioning, 
uh, in, in the plane, and I think people are more active too. I mean, they're schlepping their luggage and all that stuff, so you're likely to get a big peak. This is actually in flight, and again, deplaning, and then after that, it was good. So, you know, this kind of information is, is good to know about, and it, it might be, you know, a good reason when you get on a plane to have your N95 mask uh, handy and, and use it, which I, I do whenever I travel through airports. So they have some uses. Um, on a broader scale, uh, transparency and disclosure of information about air quality I think is a great thing, and I hope everyone has heard about the Boston Schools Project. They've put uh, indoor air quality sensors in all of their schools, and you can go to a dashboard um, on the web, and you can see all of those, and you can zero in on specific schools and specific rooms where they've put sensors. Of course, sometimes you can find that the CO2 concentration is 200 parts per million, which suggests that maybe they ought to have someone go uh, look at the calibration. But uh, by and large, this produces a huge amount of data that can be very helpful in identifying uh, facilities that need uh, to be upgraded. And I imagine a lot of them that do are naturally ventilated and don't have mechanical uh, outside air. Uh, so I'm getting to the, the end here. I want to mention before uh, uh, I stop that uh, this brand new actuary position document is a really good, concise read that covers a lot of the things that I've talked about. It has uh, references that uh, you'll find interesting on some of the scientific background. You can get that uh, at the actuary website. Just go there and search for position documents and you'll find it in the list along with some other good ones. But this is about as current uh, a summary of the state of the art as so uh, you can find and you'll see most of the things that we talked about are in this list and a few that uh, aren't. It's like uh, air cleaning directed at CO2 removal alone. I'm sure some of you have seen technologies advertised that scrub CO2 out of the air, which is not a particularly useful thing to do and it confuses the issue even further. So let's uh, wrap it up here with a few uh, summary thoughts. Uh, we've talked about the use of CO2 and about the importance of CO2 literally for centuries. Um, um, it has acceptable uses for ventilation measurement and for IAQ assessment, uh, but it's not really a good overall indicator of indoor air quality and it has some limitations for uh, controlling airflow as well. Uh, while there are certainly reasons to continue studying the role of CO2 as an air contaminant at low levels, we're not to the point yet where we ought to change all of our standards or become too concerned about a level of 1,000 parts per million uh, indoors. 1,276, I would maybe start sweating. Um, so there, there are lots of uh, misuses possible for uh, widespread dissemination of CO2 concentration information through things like personal sensors. But overall, I want to say that I think that it's, it's good uh, to, to have them. And the more people are aware of indoor air quality, uh, the better. And this will help do that. But we have to follow this up with appropriate education. And then uh, finally, ASHRAE's position document is a good reference. And I hope everyone will uh, get a hold of that and, and use that to uh, help solve arguments that may arise at work or in other circumstances. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. And there's time for discussion. We'd be happy to have some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, it's very possible that the school figured something out that we haven't yet. They got it down to 200. Um, oh, they're probably using the CO2 scrub. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, I'm happy to help take questions. Yeah. Oh, Lee's got a question. Yeah. One question, uh, when you're referencing bioaffluence, is that just that CO2 that is humans are breathing out, or what is the... You know? Oh, it's all the other things that are produced by metabolism. So, you know, in, you know, like the components of body odor, various VOCs and other uh, organic compounds that we're not actually measuring, they're produced in a similar proportion because they're metabolic byproducts too. And like CO2 output, they, they would change somewhat depending on, on what you eat. I don't know if you've ever had the experience, but there's some different foods will make you smell more than, than others uh, when you uh, digest them. So how is that a factor then with the CO2? How, how is that interplay with the CO2 then? 
Oh, there's a proportionality between them. So I don't know if it's exact, but that, that's the, the notion is, is that bioaffluent production and CO2 production are, uh, are coupled. So CO2 is a marker or a tracer for, for the bioaffluents. It's a lot easier to measure CO2 than to try to measure these other things. Any other questions? Yeah, it's kind of the same theme, but really, but what was the difference in the two studies that you said, the Denmark study and the one that the other study that sort of showed, okay, there may be this correlation? Right, so, so in one case, we've got a chamber with, with subjects in it, and let's say we establish a ventilation rate that gives us a, a, a concentration of 600 parts per million. Now I change that, not by changing the ventilation rate, uh, but by injecting pure CO2. Uh, the rate at which bioethylene is being removed is the same because the source is the same and the outdoor airflow rate is the same. So that's what Satish et al. did. And uh, the DTU group in Denmark did that. But then they did it without injecting CO2. They, they turned down the ventilation. So they set it to have 500 parts per million initially, and then they increased it by reducing the ventilation. So now we're changing the rate at which we're removing bioethylene as well. So that concentration should be going up in proportion to CO2. But that, that's the difference. And they found significant effects in that case and not in the other. Yeah, Michael, there, Benny? Thanks, Kyle. Good question. So I think I read the latest ASHRAE position paper. I'm not sure if it's the same one you're referring to, but if, I didn't get a clear idea if they've changed their uh, their recommendations as far as CO2 levels. Now, for classrooms, for example, students, I've heard from the work done out, out, uh, out west by uh, uh, Fisk and Priscilla, 700, 800 parts per billion should be what we're aiming for to avoid uh, uh, mental degradation. What is ASHRAE saying about this now? Uh, well, ASHRAE has never, uh, as I was pointing out, has a, it, in standard said that CO2 should be at, at a certain level. Uh, there was a lot of confusion caused because there was an appendix to standard 62 for a long time that showed how you get a CO2 concentration that relates to a certain ventilation rate, and they happen to use 15 CFM per person or 16 CFM, that gives you 700 above ambient, and when ambient was 300, then that would be 1,000. But that was actually pulled from the standard because it was confusing uh, people. As far as you know, Fisk's work and others, um, sure, there, there have been uh, studies done for a long time that have said that we should have higher ventilation rates uh, because we can see reduced sick building syndrome, syndrome uh, incidents, and uh, some uh, improvement in, in work performance. You know, the question is, how significant is that? Is it significant enough to change the standards and the committees that write the standards and the committees that write the code, uh, more importantly, have never been persuaded of that. I would like to see a higher, uh, higher standard for air quality set, but I don't think we should get there with ventilation because of the energy implications. I think we need to focus a lot more on uh, air cleaning technology to, to help us do that efficiently so that we don't have to have this ongoing compromise or, or tension between uh, decarbonization and energy efficiency and indoor environmental quality. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Over here. Uh, so you mentioned direct occupant count as a maybe better measure of how to like, basically how to do demand controlled ventilation. Is that maybe like a design consideration for how many people the space is designed for, or more operational, like having some kind of occupancy sensor linked to uh, the systems? Oh, well, sure. We're talking about operations, but there's, there's a you know what the capacity is supposed to be when a space is designed. The question is, uh, could we now easily measure how many people are? in this space by some other means. I can't, oh. So if everybody's got their phone turned on, you might be able to do that. But there are also um, uh, closed circuit TV camera methods that have been used to try to count 
people. Believe me, the government has done all of these things for military purposes. Uh, portal sensors, you can measure someone walking through a doorway in a particular direction, and, and you can add those up. So there are a lot of different ways to do it. And if we could do that, you could take that number and the size of the room we know, you calculate what the ventilation rate should be right now, uh, which would reduce a lot of the sources of error that we have to deal with in trying to use CO2. So we invented more time. If anyone has any more questions, we can answer a few more. Um, I, I always wonder what happens um, during flight, because I saw like um, on airplane, they have air change. They have an air change every like three, four, five minutes. It's supposed to have like 15 ACH per hour. Oh, it's like, just like 30 air changes an hour. Yeah. Like how, like if you have like 20, 30 air change per hour, how did you get to like a thousand four hundred ppm on the plane. That's yeah. Well, the, the occupant density is very high, as anyone who's flown an economy knows. Uh, <laughs> business class a little bit different, but the, so it's, it's very high density. And again, air change rates. This is rather confusing. The the volume per person on an airplane is, is tiny compared to say in a room like this with a, a high ceiling. And about fifty percent of the air. Uh, when the system is running, when the onboard AC is, is working, is outdoor air. Uh, when you're on the ground, those, those peaks that you see during uh, boarding and deplaning, uh, those systems may be lower capacity, but what I notice most of the time is they're not connected at all. And that, that's what happened at my home airport. There's, there's no truck sitting next to the air, this uh, commuter airplane with air conditioning connected to it. What the captain usually says is, yeah, I know it's warm back there, but we'll get the air conditioning going in a few seconds or minutes when we're up in the air. So I think a lot of the time there's no ventilation there at all during that period. Any other questions? Frank? Great presentation, very informative. Thank you. Um, are there two or three, and you may have addressed this in a previous question answering, but are there two or three takeaways a building owner, owner or operator could have on what they should do based on the information you presented and what you know? Uh, sure, well, I would, would use, I think measuring CO2 uh, in a building in an ongoing way is important because it helps to identify problem spots. And I've seen people showing data from their uh, kids' movement around school. They, they go from you know Latin classroom to, to math to the computer center, it turns out the computer center is a tiny little space that's all buttoned up and, and has, has high uh, CO2. So you can identify places that need um, some kind of work. They're, they're under ventilated by design or there's uh, a problem. You can also establish uh, maybe some way of relating the, the CO2 level to uh, air quality for the space or the, uh, for the occupants. I think it's important to do that because uh, the numbers can vary so much within the range of what is it really ought to be acceptable that it, it confuses folks if they've got one number in their head. So I, I think those are the good uses. And I think that uh, demand control ventilation can be effective, but um, you, you need to do it right. And so you, you need to really understand what you're, uh, how you're using the CO2 measurements that you're taking to do that. The one, one CO2 sensor in the re return for a, a multi-space system, not not a good thing. Um, so th those are probably the takeaways. Um, trust, verify, use it, but don't overuse it. Very good. Lee again. Erica. So I took over a new role uh, about a year ago, um, director of operations for a medium-sized property management company. And one of the challenges that I have is um, a lot of the, the smaller buildings don't have the uh, equipment or the capability to monitor the CO2. So the question is, how much outside air should you bring in to make sure you're uh, providing a, a good environment for the tenants? And so that's really kind of, you know, it, it, without the, the CO2 as a tool, are there any recommendations that you can make related to, I mean, you know, if you just provide the, the comfort 
air you bring in, as far as how much fresh air should you be bringing in, I guess, is what all my engineers yeah. want to know, and I don't have an answer, so. Well, I mean, it, it certainly could, could say that, that uh, standards like 62.1 will tell you what you ought to have. Um, you can measure it just by actually measuring the outdoor air flow rate, and that's something that ought to be done periodically, no matter what. CO2 is, is just another way of, of measuring the uh, ventilation air change rate, but it's, it's not the only one. I, I think if you can't instrument buildings uh, in a, sig a significant way um, permanently, that spot checks are good. So use some in instrumentation that can move from building to building periodically to, to see how they're doing and, and determine whether there are issues there that ought to be addressed. That's what I would do to, to reduce the costs. It doesn't have to be built into the system. It could be portable. Very good. And if you're going for LEED certification, going for the credits with 62.1 also helps get kind of a benchmark number on that as well, or um, working with your <coughs> preferred consultant to investigate some of those <laughs> details too. <laughs> You use the indoor air quality procedure. You know, that's, I think, the, one of the, the best improvements in Ashley Standard 62.1 in a long time is that we now have a list of specific contaminants um, and levels of concern and a requirement that there be so called uh, objective evaluation of the building after it's cons uh, constructed to, to verify it. That, that's a big change from what was there before. Last question, uh, what airline were you flying? <laughs> <laughs> They're all about as bad. <laughs> American. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.